that's the biggest thing about social media. You see someone with 100K followers, you're like, oh my gosh, they're doing big things. Um, and here you are, you got your 100. But I'll tell you one thing about being a mental health professional on social media. Everybody that's listening to you is not following you. I have noticed a tremendous amount of people that DM me or email me that aren't even on my followers list. And I think it's the fear of like, oh my gosh, if somebody clicks this person, they're going to see the therapist or they're going to think like something's wrong with me. I think it's like that uncomfortability of having a therapist on your friends list sometimes, but they're listening. This is Therapist Clubhouse, a podcast for private practice entrepreneurs. I'm Annie Schusler. This week, I'm talking to Patrice N. Douglas, a private practice entrepreneur in Rancho Cucamonga, California. Listen as we talk about destigmatizing mental health services, using social media in your private practice, and balancing agency work with private practice. Welcome, Patrice N. Douglas. I'm so excited to be talking to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So I want to talk to you about your entrepreneurial journey and I know the the first place that I became aware of you was on Instagram, where I saw that you had these shirts that you were selling, Black Minds Matter. So that was the first thing that made me want to talk to you. Can you tell me a little bit about selling those? Yeah. So I created a Teespring t-shirt store. It's called, well, it doesn't really have a name, but I guess I would call it Therapy Saves Lives. Mm-hmm. And I have various shirts in the store that all the proceeds go towards providing therapy to those who can't afford it or low cost um, mental health workshop. Excellent. What inspired you to create the shirts? Um, I think the biggest conflict about mental health is bringing awareness. A lot of people don't know where to get started. They don't know how to bring up the conversation or continue the conversation. So I felt like maybe creating t-shirts to make people a walking conversation uh, would be more beneficial and, and, you know, get the blood flowing and talk about mental health and stigmas. And it seems to be working pretty well. People, I'll wear the shirts and I'll walk down the street and they'll say, yeah, therapy did save my life. Or yeah, you know what? Black minds do matter. So it actually works. Are your colleagues wearing the shirts? I want to get one, but I'm yes. wondering, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, some of them have all of my shirts. But yeah, my family, my coworkers, my friends, strangers, everyone seems to really enjoy wearing the t-shirts and waiting to see when's the next one I'm going to drop. <laughs> nice. So your practice is called Empire Counseling and Consultation. And I know you specialize in online counseling and you work with people in New York and in California and even though you're located in California physically. And you work with people around anger issues and destigmatizing therapy, and especially for people of color. Can you tell me about how you chose your niches? Um, you know, I think niche kind of chose me. Uh-huh. Um, when I was in my master's program, I was working in um, ABA, working with children with autism, and I was just noticing how it was really stressful trying to manage school. Um, working in that profession and then trying to maintain income Mm. Um, because it, because an ABA, the money, I mean, the reward of helping the kids is great, but the hours and the pay is not that great. So you're often struggling. Um, And so I remember my mother telling me, you know, back in the day that her and her friends went to this anger management training because everybody was hyping it up that you just get this certification, you hold a couple of groups, you can make all this money. And I said, okay. And so I kind of started looking into things and identifying what would be more helpful for my community. And I realized that anger was a big component. So I decided to go get the certification. Now, did I think it was going to take me all the way here? No, I didn't think anyone would be that interested in anger management, Mm -hmm. but it ended up turning into a real business and everybody's requesting it. So it just kind of snuck up on me. (laughs) And did you find that you had a passion for that kind of work that you hadn't even known you had or what happened for you in doing the work? I think I started really identifying how I began to grow as I got Mm -hmm. older and even in my anger management skills, because when I was younger, yes, I was feisty. I didn't have a filter. I kind of just, you know, whatever came out of my mouth worked. But as I got older and I started realizing, you know, how words really affect people and how it portrays myself, I started realizing that a lot of the things that are taught in anger management, I kind of learned over the years. And I'm an example of how you can overcome some of the bad habits. Mm. So teaching anger management for me is therapeutic because it also keeps me in check. Sometimes when I'm doing the lessons, I'm like, 
oh yeah, Patrice, don't forget about that. Like you did practice that earlier today. So it also keeps me in line, but it also, I feel like it helps other people feel comfortable about having anger issues because there's such a big stigma around anger management. When somebody says, oh, I'm in anger management, people automatically think that they're a violent person, but it can mean so much. They can be a stressed out person. They can be a passive aggressive person. They can be a depressed person based off of their anger. So I'm able to channel a lot of things just through the conversations of anger management. Interesting. And do you think that sometimes, I'm curious about your philosophy about anger. Do you think sometimes it can be positive? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, Anger is something that we need to have. It creates change. It alerts us that something is wrong. So we never want to eliminate it. We just want to channel what we're feeling to make a resolution. That's all Mm -hmm. it's about. So yes, anger can have many positive aspects. I think we see it every day in people, Um, people that are upset about, you know, political things, things that are happening in the world, they're creating change. They're using their anger to do better. Yeah, I'm thinking about the kids, uh, the survivors of the shooting in Florida right now. They're pissed, right? And it's so powerful hearing them yelling um, BS together. You know, no matter what what people's thoughts are about guns, the fact that these kids are coming together angry and aligned and able to really use their voices is so powerful. Absolutely. And that is an example of positive anger, having peaceful Mm -hmm. protests, speaking out about, you know, the injustices, the negative would be, you know, going around the city and, you know, tearing things up. That would be a negative component of anger. But how they're expressing how pissed off they are is very healthy. And Patrice, you've got clients who see you online. You've got clients who see you in person. Is that right? Yes. So tell me about working online and how much of your business is online and and what you find works about that and what you find challenging about that. Um, A small percentage of my business is online. I do have a few clients in the Los Angeles area that uh, reach out to me through online because I am in Rancho Cucamonga so that 45 to an hour hour drive is a lot for them. Um, The New York one, it's still picking up. I think Mm -hmm. people are trying to get used to the fact that I don't live in New York. Um, So it's a little weird for them. But what I enjoy about online therapy is being able to access people that maybe can't come into the office. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a lot of our employers don't have the typical eight to five schedule. And most therapists are not going to be in their office till like 10 at night or 11 Mm -hmm. at night. So having that access to them at those hours at home or how be it can be really beneficial to the client. Because I think a lot of people don't reach out for therapy because they don't know how to fit it into their schedule. Yeah. Um, When you have to add a, you know, sometimes an hour and a half between driving and parking and driving back again, that can be really prohibitive sometimes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or for the people that maybe, you know, work um, graveyard, early morning shifts, like Mm -hmm. your later hours are when they're sleeping or, you know, when you begin, they're still working. So it can be a really big conflict. So having them able to, you know, put the kids to bed, get dinner, take a shower, relax, and then just get on their, you know, their laptop, their tablet or their phone to have, you know, a 50 minute conversation about what's going on in their life is really help. And that's what I love about um, online therapy is I'm able to give everybody an equal opportunity to get access to some help. I'm thinking too, Patrice, so you're working with some people in New York. And so with the time difference, that could actually be kind of beneficial. Yes. So on my website, I advertise that I can see you as late as midnight because that's nine o'clock for me. So that's not a big deal. So yeah, the time difference can be helpful during the day. It can be a little awkward Mm because I still have my, I work at two agencies on top of my private practice, my business. So having the the three hour time difference could be difficult during the day, but as far as the nighttime to the late night goes, it's perfect. Right. You're really busy. How many sessions are you finding you like to have in a week in your therapy practice? The goal is about probably to schedule 12 and at least do 10. Um, because right now I am at two nonprofit agencies. So I, and my time is very limited on top of, I am in my doctoral program. Mm -hmm. Um, at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. So ideally, adding more than 10 clients in my practice is probably not even possible. Once I begin to kind of phase out of the agency work and focus more on my businesses, I would probably say 15 
clients mm-hmm. is probably beneficial um, for me because my biggest piece too is being an advocate for mental health. So I have to make time to make sure that I'm reaching those avenues to make sure that I'm doing other things than just seeing clients. Even podcast interviews, um, you know, doing the Instagram thing, writing blogs, talking to people about mental health awareness, like all of those take time out of your day. And so if I'm at an agency, you know, eight to nine hours a day and then I'm in my private practice, there's really no time for me to really get the message across about breaking stigmas and mental health. So I always have to make sure to have that balance of, yes, I'm going to see clients, but I'm also going to do my advocacy work because that's what keeps me going Mm -hmm. Um, on top of self-care, which I try to find which is difficult sometimes, but that's the biggest thing is I don't want to get sucked up into seeing so many clients that the other parts of me that, that I feed into psychology is not met. Okay. So the, the destigmatizing work is huge. You're saying that's, that's really what's feeding you. That's your, your huge message, your huge why it sounds like. Yes, I think that's why um, my following has gotten bigger on social media because Mm -hmm. I pretty much cut the BS and I get straight to the point about, you know, what is right, what is wrong, how we can do better. You know, bringing attention to everyone is human. And so we all have similar struggles so we can all relate and to not always be judgmental. I mean, with the celebrities, with people in higher positions, we all can suffer from mental illnesses. So it's important that I continue to spread that message. I have became aware of you on Instagram, like I was saying. Is that the main place that you're focusing your social media time? Or what would you say about that of where you're focusing? I think Instagram is it. I tried to dabble in Twitter. Mm -hmm. I just think that 160 um, characteristics is not enough for me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I find myself getting frustrated. But I used to have Twitter Tuesdays where... I would watch a particular show on TV and I would tweet the mental health components to it. So um, I guess like the stars from like the uh, reality shows of like Love and Hip Hop, um, Lethal Weapon, uh, Real Housewives, they have, you know, retweeted and commented and, you know, brought up some great points about how I'm bringing mental health awareness to their shows. Um, I think something happened probably where I was working on my dissertation or something and it kind of just fell apart. But um that's pretty much what I use Twitter for. But for Instagram, that's where the most people connect with me. I get DMs about questions. People are interacting on my posts. So probably I would say Instagram is like my everything. You're really doing a lot there. And tell me about the therapist of the week. So every week I try to highlight a therapist. They don't have to be in California. They can be anywhere. I think I've even highlighted some in the UK. And the point about it is, is to show that There are therapists out there, and I'm going to give you a scope of what they practice and why they like to do therapy, because I think that's the biggest thing that people say is, I can't find a therapist. So here you are. I'm finding you some right here, and I'm giving you a whole glimpse of themselves, what they do, if they take insurance, if they have a website, if they're licensed. And Mm -hmm. so if I'm giving you all this information, I'm pretty much doing all the heavy work for you. All you got to do is make the call. Excellent. And so it's so interesting, Patrice, because I work with all these therapists, many of them um, struggling to find enough clients and, you know, and then they do, and there are plenty of clients out there, but I think you're really proving that by saying you're also hearing from a lot of people saying, I can't find a good therapist. Yeah. I think it's overwhelming to go on psychology today Yeah, and just see all these faces and all these bios and you really don't know how to connect. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think having a glimpse of therapists, business, social medias, really getting to identify why they got into the field, how long they've been in the field. um, I think it just takes a little bit, a more personal route than psychology today. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's why I like using it. Do I know if anyone's got any clients for my therapist a week? I don't know, but I know their followers go up. So there's something about them that other people want to know about. You never know with something like that, what the route is to somebody, you know, hiring a therapist, that it might be a very direct route, or it may be, like you said, they got more followers, somebody became aware of them. And then by the time that person calls them, they may say, I'm not sure how I found you. Right. So it creates this, you know, this great piece about connecting um, people with therapists, as well as, as therapists, we really don't get recognition Mm -hmm. I mean, how often do we get, we don't get a a day, we don't get like a mental health profession day or therapist week. So I think it's important to make us feel special too, because we do a lot. We carry a lot of people's emotional baggage and we really don't get the recognition, I believe in my opinion, that we need. So 
if I can highlight some therapists and make their week, then so be it. Something I notice about your marketing is that it's very like on brand. Like you've got you've got your brand really defined. Can you tell me about that process of of how you came to that? Yeah, it definitely wasn't on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely did hire um, a branding specialist to help me with it. And it's funny because I didn't get one that was in the mental health profession. So figuring out, you know, telling her about our ethics and what we can do and what we can't do and <laughs> all that stuff. And my credentials, because we know like license versus intern versus training, you got to be very careful about how you market yourself and present yourself. Um, so I was able to, um, and her name is Nicole Matthews. She's from Chicks Inc. And she actually taught me how to stay on brand and be true to my brand and not be afraid to be a business owner. Because I didn't want to do this. I really just, to be honest, I really just wanted to work for the county Mm -hmm. of Riverside and be a therapist. I never had any intentions of doing all this. So it was very new to me, very scary to me. And having her in my corner really helped me see that it's okay to have a business. It's okay to want to be a business owner. Let's just make sure that when your name is across a board or it comes up that people already know who you are. And so once I figured out that's what branding was, just to really identify who I was, I became more comfortable. Mm. How do you feel now about being an entrepreneur? Stressed out. (laughs) (laughs) It's a stressful process. Um, Mm -hmm. I think I'm taking it really slow. When I first started in a prior practice, I was just doing anger management psychoeducation because as an intern, a trainee, things like that, you can't have a private practice doing mental health on your own. So mine was really focused on anger management and stress management. Mm-hmm. Um, so for the first year of me doing this, I really just had fun with it. I mean, I was charging really low rates just to see if I like the fill of private practice and if I can keep people in my private practice. So for the first year, like I didn't really make too much money. I mean, I was charging like as low as $40 a session, mm-hmm. which a lot of people looked at me like, are you serious? For <laughs> the one-on-one attention that you're giving to anger management, it's only $40. I'm like, yeah, well, it's psychoeducation. Some of them have to see me for a whole year. I mean, let's do 40 times 52. That's a lot of money. And I just really want to see if I like private practice. And I did. So I think that first year of me just testing things out because I had other sources of income working at the two agencies, I didn't have to put all my eggs in one basket in private practice. I was able to really see that, you know, I can do this. Now, do I want just to be a private practice therapist? I don't know yet. I think Mm -hmm. um, that cushion, that comfortability of knowing that you can still have um, income flowing through an agency Mm -hmm. is still ideal for me. Also, too, I still want to tap into people that are in the agencies, the low income families, the the pro bono work and things like that. Um, I think because those are the people that need help too. There's this weird stigma that all therapists get into private practice to take all your money. That's not true. Sometimes there's a lot of agency rules and policies that a lot of therapists don't like. They feel like it takes away from the continuity of care for people. So they decide to go on their own and really, you know, make things happen that way. But a part of me always thinks I will want to be a part of an agency. Patrice, what advice would you have for people who are getting started with social media? Breathe. Mm -hmm. Don't get caught up in the followers. Mm Because I think that's the biggest thing about social media. You see someone with 100K followers, like, oh my gosh, they're doing big things. Um, And here you are, you got your 100. But I'll tell you one thing about being a mental health professional on social media. Everybody that's listening to you is not following you. I have noticed a tremendous amount of people that DM me or email me that aren't even on my followers list. And I think it's the fear of like, oh my gosh, if somebody clicks this person, they're going to see it's a therapist. Are they going to think like something's wrong with me? I think it's like that uncomfortability of having a therapist on your friends list sometimes, but they're listening. Mm -hmm. So if you're just getting started, just go with what your heart says. Don't give me mental health, you know, medical advice. Don't do that. But just be true to yourself. Pick what you want to center yourself around on social media. What do you want people to know about you? What do you want people to know about your practice? And I think that will kind of help you stay in perspective. And like I said, don't get caught up in how many followers you have because I don't have that many followers. Well, I guess a thousand to a lot of people is a lot of followers, but I mean, that took me like almost two years. Like let's keep it all the way 100. I did not (laughs) start with a thousand. Um, I had wrote this blog about um, how to support your friend that happens to be a therapist and that thing blew up. 
and I got like over 150 followers in a month. I have not gotten over 150 followers in a month since I've been staying stagnant. So don't get caught up in that. Some people buy their followers too. Like I said, don't get caught up in the numbers. Get caught up in the message that you're trying to send. And really just connect with other therapists online. It's really cute how we have like a little community mm-hmm. of therapists. Like it's, you know, our my state, every other state, but we're so supportive of each other because I feel like maybe our friends and family don't understand the support that we need, but we get it. So it's an amazing community to be a part of. And you actually learn a lot and you get to connect and do a lot of amazing things with our little online community of therapists. So just have fun with social media. Don't look at it as something that is going to make you money. It could or it couldn't. Just be more proactive about the message that you're trying to send and you'll have a good time on social media. That's great, Patrice. Yeah. And so it's more about what do you want to be known for? Who do you want to be online than looking at your number of followers? Yeah. Engagement is so much more important than, than numbers. It is. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times, um, I mean, to be honest, I don't think any of my followers have converted into clients. Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Because that might be a little awkward too, that you follow your therapist on Instagram. So that's what I'm saying. You don't want to ever get caught up in like, okay, I have to have a perfect page with a bunch of followers because that's how I'm going to get my clientele. Mm -hmm. No, what's going to happen most likely, and this has totally happened, is that someone follows you on social media and they tell their family and friends about you. Hey, you should go check them out. And that's how you can get clients. But don't ever think that your that your followers are going to be your clients. Because ideally, do you even want that? I mm. personally don't. So that's okay with me. But I think that's just the biggest piece is just to have fun with it and just and just make sure that your message gets across that you know you're very supportive of mental health and, and what you want to do to help out. Great. And it looks like it's been for you as well as for me. It's a great way to be networking, getting to know other therapists. Yeah, there's so many podcasts, there's so many blogs, there's so many amazing people doing amazing things. And the greatest piece, in all honesty, of where I am today is because of the Instagram community. I mean, like I said, I had no intentions of doing the things that I have done thus far, but you guys keep pushing me to do things. Like, speak here, do this, what about this? And I'm like, you guys really want to listen to me? You you really, you think I know stuff? So um <laughs> You guys really push for me to go outside of my own box. And so I have to be very grateful for Instagram because I probably wouldn't do nearly half the things I'm doing now without Instagram. Right. Like you and I wouldn't be talking. No. So yes, Instagram is awesome. Even if you want to use it just for the networking and not trying to get a, you know, a following of people that can listen to your message, just the networking alone. Like you said, it's funner than LinkedIn Mm -hmm. and it's just a good time. Excellent. So Patrice, what, like when you think about social media in the course of your very busy week, how much time are you spending on there? On my business or my personal? (laughs) That's a really good question. So I would say your business. Well, on the average, you know, they say that you're supposed to post three times a day, which I mean, that's pretty difficult. I would probably say on a given day, maybe an hour. A lot of things that I post is just spur of the moment. Mm-hmm. I used to sit down on that Sunday, you know, better Sundays or Sundays are a day for better content. Okay. So I try to make that whole calendar thing and, Ooh, what am I going to post for a week? And it just don't, it doesn't work for me. I am so spur of the moment. Soon as something pops up in my head, I'm on Canva and I'm typing it up and I'm about to post it. So what kind of helps me is that I try to have like, you know, one new message a day, maybe, you know, advertise my t-shirts and then maybe repost something that another therapist said, boom, I got three right there. I didn't have to come up with three original posts because that's frustrating. That's draining. And in all reality, I really don't have time for that. But I would say on an average of liking other people's posts, seeing what's going on, probably an hour. Okay. So quite a bit, really. And so then I think that it's really important that you're enjoying it. Yes. I think yeah. there are times and it's totally on my on my page that I'm like, oh, I need a social media break. I think there was at one point I went like a whole like 14 months without taking a break and I was drained. Sometimes um, social media does, uh, does drain you. So you do have to take a break and it's OK. But you got to be mindful of how social media is affecting your life. If you feel like you don't want to post that it's a chore, then take a break because it should yeah. it should be fun. One thing I did recently was um, I don't post nearly as much as you do, Patrice. So I'm glad I'm talking to you about this so people can hear some different options. But one thing I did recently when I felt like I was looking at social media too often, I started, there was just a day a couple of weeks ago where I realized I'm turning into a robot because I'm checking 
checking too often. And yes. so I just, I just deleted it all off my phone. And then I put it back on a few days later, but it was just a really good cleanse. It's really crazy because I will even catch myself like at a stoplight, like, okay, scroll. And I'm like, I just scrolled 30 seconds ago. Like, it's amazing uh-huh. how you conform to social media. And so you have to break the cycle. So sometimes you do have to um, delete those apps and just give your brain a rest. Yeah. And it'll be there. It'll be it'll there be when there. you're ready. <laughs> it will. It will be there. It never goes away. <laughs> <laughs> what is the very best place for people to find you and throw compliments at you? Instagram. Um, you can find me on Instagram at the Patrice Nicole. Um, if you want to follow me on Facebook, you can. I post a lot of different mental health articles and other things that's happening with therapists that are, you know, producing really great content. Um, you can find me on there at Patrice and Douglas. But yeah, the easiest way is Instagram. And I look at my DMs. So you can reach out and I'll respond back. Yes, please reach out. Awesome, Patrice. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me. That was fun. Thanks for listening to Therapist Clubhouse. If you're looking for support to take your private practice to the next level, we can help. Go to coachingwithannie.com and start with our private practice success assessment. It'll help you figure out your next best steps. I'll see you next week.